Okay, let's get going. Hour number three on this New Year's Eve. And I hope all of you are getting ready for a year that will probably be a bigger challenge than 2014, uh, if that's possible for many of you. A lot of people are having a lot of trouble, but we will be here to help as best we can, uh, doing his part up in somewhere in Thailand, over in Thailand, is Yoshi Shimatsu, who will be with us momentarily. We're trying to connect with him. Our special guest, Dana Durnford, apparently feeling much better this week, is up uh, somewhere off the coast of British Columbia. Are you there, Dana? Can you hear me? Hi, Jeff. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Happy New Year, year my friend. We got a single. Yeah. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. Happy New Year, too. I almost never got the phone call again that time. (laughs) It's hard. Yeah. How, I haven't uh, even crammed on the boat here, so you're still I on the boat. Remember where I had the phone? <laughs> I was looking oh, for geez. it. I could hear it. Yeah. I was scrambling. It was pretty funny. Uh, and that's a good thing. It's good to have a bit of humor because there's not a lot of humor these days. No, there isn't. I don't. I, in fact, I think that's the the most obvious thing missing from our societal goings on is uh, people laughing anymore. I don't see it. I it just is. Don't, don't yeah, see happiness. Point. No, you don't see it. It's, and, um, you know, the truth is happiness, I guess, at this stage. And so, well, and, we you know, the, the, the truth is being so corrupted and perverted by so many different people and agendas and True. agents. So we just try and call it, re- I could try and call it reality. I don't, I don't even know <laughs> what reality is anymore some days, to tell that, you the truth. That's a great point, though, you just made. That's a fantastic point, actually. Well, everyone claims that's to have the truth, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, as soon as you, claim to have the truth, what does that mean? It means, generally speaking, that you've stopped looking. And as soon as you stop the process of exploring and looking and evaluating and thinking, you've taken yourself out of the game. Because yeah, the truth don't. the truth can change. It does. No, oh, it's a strong point, a very, very intelligent point, actually. In fact, uh, to me, the truth, and, and what I was referring to, I guess, in one sense, but what, what the point you're making is obvious. What I was referring to when I said that was that, for me, the truth was the pictures, and that nobody can go back and take a different picture. That's, that's those are uh, uh, yeah. cast in stone, so to speak. Uh, yeah. They are absolute truths, and they are reality, and nothing is going to change that. It's now predicted that the entire West Coast species of orca is going to be extinct here in a few years. Uh, they haven't had one baby that the orca scientists say has lived beyond one year of age uh, since uh, 311. Right, They're, and they stopped singing. Go ahead. They, no, you told me that before. Now, that's interesting. You've heard them for many, many years. Tell us what's like yes. to hear them singing at night. Well, I mean, you got to realize that that's how they, uh, for most people out there, that's how they talk. Mm-hmm. Not familiar with this. This is, and they talk over vast distances, and sound carries extremely long ways, uh, and with clarity on top of that. And so, they're extremely well known for for their vocalizations and their echoes. That's echo sounding on top of that, but it's also yeah. vocalizing. So they have many uses for it, and, and so they're using it all the time. And it's distinct. You know what it is, and it's the same thing with the porpoise. And the dolphins, uh, you know, they'll come by and ping you. And it reminds me of another story, and I'm not digressing, but uh, seismic vessels about six miles away from us were, were pinging the ocean floor day after day. Uh-huh. And a friend of mine happened to know who the skipper was on that ship. And so we went out there and got showers on it when they were anchored at night in visibility. We took a run out there. He said, hey, I know those people. And sure enough, he knew the skipper, so we got treated royalty. And they were surveying the coastline for minerals, I guess, and oil and gas and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the government was paying for it, and, and I mean, they don't spare any money. It's amazing how much money you can dump into something like that for the corporations to go out. Oh, yeah. Right, right? But back to the whales, it's a wonderful, it was a wonderful thing, and now that that has stopped, uh, I mean, that should be obvious. And I tell it to people all the time. The whales stop singing here in British Columbia. And that really shocks them. Because hmm. everybody over here understands it too, you know? It's a big thing in British Columbia. 
to cover it. I remember stepping off the side of the boat one time to go diving, and as I went to step off the boat, I almost stepped on a killer whale's head. He was right there, about a foot under the water, right underneath me, looking at me. And I grabbed onto it and swung around the ladder wow. and came back on the other side with all this gear on, you know, big heavy weight belts and backpacks. And, wow. And, uh, but they would, he was by himself, and that's considered a rogue whale. And you won't die if there's just a single whale by themselves to a family oriented. And so I took that day off. That was what really shocked me that that happened. That was up in Telegraph Cove, Alert Bay area on the inside of Vancouver Island. That's a remarkable story. Eat cables all day. Yeah, and so I, I used to come up and sit on the back of the boat, and then you have to wait to off gas and go back down and get another 15 minutes and come up and sit on the back of the boat mm-hmm. for 20 minutes off gas and go back down. And you can chew up a tank of air in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, mm. and those dives, and you mm-hmm. eat nine tanks a day doing it. And so you have all this nitrogen in your body, and it's like an alcohol effect. And so you were like triple the shock. You still had your wits about you. Your, oh, it I get magnifies it. your shock, your your huh. terror that goes through you. And I'll never forget it. No, I'll never forget. You, could it. you see his eye? Yeah, right there, and his teeth. He was like just right below the surface, barely below the surface. Wow. And the tender and everything was looking at him, and we were just yeah, that was pretty spooky. And he just yeah. sat there, and I was like, wow. <laughs> Who Did knows ever, what could have happened? Who knows? Uh, you could have been gone. Um, yeah, it could have been gone in that job sure. of a hat. Oh, yeah. Here's, uh, here's see, a I little... don't see him up here. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I haven't Finish. seen any. No. You haven't seen any orca? Up here, no. Not, not one. And I, I ran around out here. We were stuck here for four weeks, and everybody, everybody here was, when the weather finally broke after four weeks, put their boats in the water, and went to the fuel dock. And so when I went, I took off to the fuel dock later that morning and headed out. But the fuel dock told me they knew me at this stage because I've been there for, here for four weeks. I was getting showers there. And they said, Dana, you said, you know, everybody is saying this morning this was the strangest four weeks of weather they ever seen. And, of course, you cover the harp, how that gets used all the time. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's definitely what was going on on the coastline. They were using harp up here for something. But, yeah, no, it almost wore me down four weeks. I almost gave up. And then I resolved myself and sat it out and got the data. And I'm heading back out as soon as I'm waiting for a prop to show up. My prop uh, had a fly in it, I guess. And it tore one of the one of the propellers off it altogether. So mm. it's dysfunctional. And I, there's no dealership up here. Mm. So I'm stuck here for another two days waiting for a prop. Where are you but, right now? Back in Prince Rupert. Mm-hmm. Back in Prince Rupert, I was out. Um, I was out about forty-five nautical miles, and I hit about in three days. I stayed out for three days, and I hit around all together around ninety islands, and I never seen. I seen five starfish finally on day two at the very last island, and all of them were melted and deformed and. There's no survival for those five. But that was all I seen. And there was a little bit of kelp weed here and there, a little tiny pecks of it, mm-hmm. and a little tiny bit of bull kelp, and there was nothing else whatsoever. And that was, say, this day two, that was around 60 islands. That is unbelievable. That is, that it's, that's worse. Up here on the wildest west coast, northern Canada, in the middle of nowhere, than it was down in the populated areas. There's less, and when I say less, I mean nothing in the tidal pools itself and on the shorelines. And there's another point to that, is that at the, the high tide lines, there was a huge amount of life that lived right there. Mm-hmm. And that is completely missing too. And I don't really cover that for some reason very often, but I have. Well, but I thought I'd bring it up again. Well, sure, it's just another another zone along the, the shoreline. Yeah, it is. High right. tide, medium it's tide, like a six low tide. It's eight foot yeah. zone, right above yeah. the high tide line. Mm-hmm. And there's all kinds of uh, little animals and all kinds of plants. And well, animals. that's where a lot of things wash up and uh, and decay, and the insects yeah. come in, and the predators, right. and the scavengers, and the gulls. Right. That's where they feed. Perfect. Right. Perfect. 
And that, that, I think, should really resonate for a lot of people out there because all of that is 100% missing, every bit of it. But the, when you get down to the low tide line and they're still nutting, you can get ashore anywhere and you're not going to slip. I mean, anybody out there that knows a fisherman from years ago who spent his life on the ocean, uh, they should call him up and tell him that and say, what was it like going to shore at low tide <clears throat> and trying to get to the high tide line? And he or she will tell you that it's the most dangerous thing you can do because mm-hmm. 600 algaes and then all the seen enemies and everything else that lives in those zones, Yeah, it's extremely dangerous. It's very easy to break an arm. Very many, lots of people have dislocated shoulders, and serious bruises, twisted ankles, trying to slip their way from the low tide line up to the high tide zone where they can walk around. Right. And that's what you do. You don't stay anywhere in between it. As soon as you hit the beach, you go all the way up where you it's safe, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I understand. And that is not an issue anymore. Jump ashore anywhere and walk. It's a, it's it fall. must it must be looking in places as if it were another planet, just water it and does. rock. It's surreal, and they're polished rocks. It's like nothing ever lived there ever. Really? And yeah, oh, it's, it's like I being in a picture. mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's nothing on the rock, not even algae, or no kind of growth whatsoever. But How? there there's a little tiny. You can see the. Like the shapes where the, the uh, barnacles used to be, and they're uh-huh. all gone too. Up so here, it looks like sawdust. What's really, this is sickening. Yeah, the, the the so the impressions of the animals, you can still see some residue on on some of the right. rocks. Yeah, but that's it. There's there's really they no. They use the heavy glue to stay there, yes, but they're yes. gone, and there's no shells around, and stuff like that, of course. And there's no predators around. There's no life. The entire way up 700 miles, I've never seen a flock of birds. And this is hard to believe. Um, I mean, I I'm just yeah. I hear I hear you. I know you, and I know your work is magnificent. Yeah, you know. But this is is just it's, we are we are yeah. we are destroying yeah. our home. We have we're we in have trouble. destroyed we're it. We're in trouble. This whole planet. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about it now. For those and of you, I'll keep you... going. I'll start heading back down the coast. I tried to make it to the Charlottes, the Queen Charlotte Islands, which is the uh-huh. bullseye, because so many people around this planet are familiar with it, mm-hmm. but it's just too dangerous. I made four attempts, <clears throat> and I got into trouble three other times. And so <laughs> that what, took what the kind, What I kind made. of trouble? Oh, I went high center on a log at night, and I had to jump on the log. And How the hell do you do that in your condition? No choice. Yeah, no choice. And so you had to get a, and that was just a pure fluke. It's just a fluke, and that's the problem with that, like, you know, that while I'm doing there, it just takes a fluke. I was out here, and now I'm really cautious type person anyway, and when the tide is rising, uh, I'll go in on the rock piles, right into the rock piles itself, because I know if I land on a rock, now I got a Kevlar bottom on the boat, but mm-hmm. if I land on a rock, I know that because the tide is rising, I'll come off it shortly. And all I'll do is I'll put the engine in reverse and I'll rock the boat till the, the boat pulls itself off the rock. I see. Pole. And I, I know see. that must sound pretty bizarre to people, but this is things I've done all my life. So, and, uh, and it's not that I'm fearless or anything like that. It's just that I, I, I know the game. I know how, how to play it. And I don't go out there unless the conditions are, are you know, are, are reasonable, acceptable. Because it's always a, a calculated risk every day on the ocean. Anybody that's familiar with it. Of course it is. Yeah, BC is full of logs, and so when the tides are high, it's a very dangerous place. And nighttime, anyway, on the ocean is dangerous. Uh, but, you know, when I was running over to the Charlottes, I spent so many weeks here that the weather was going to look good overnight, and I could have made it. But as soon as I hit the log, of course, I said, okay, well, I'm not going to take a chance. I'll head back in. And it's not that far under, when you think about it under circumstances, but once again, that's all it takes. It's just something goes wrong, and all of a sudden you're in, you're in the trouble. Now wow. I have yeah. endless amounts of uh, survival gears, immersion suits, mm-hmm. beacons, uh, GPS beacons. I have what they call e-boots. They're twelve hundred bucks, and you just pull on, and Coast Guard will come and get you because you paid twelve hundred bucks for that privilege. Basically, is what it adds up to. Mm. 
And if the boat was to capsize, these things will launch and put out a single. But these boats won't capsize because they won't be in those kinds of condition. And the idea of these Coast Guard uh, Zodiacs is that the ride itself, it's a luxury ride. And so if you're going through waves or going through lumpy stuff, you've got a very comfortable ride. You can't get a better ride than that. But there's not a lot of room on these things, and that's fine too because it's just me. And the idea is we've got to have that data at all costs. And I'm just, at this stage now, I'm just satisfied that I got those three days in. And then now I'm just, I'm dedicated to going up the inside passages mm-hmm. and just take my time and dodge out if the weather's good and get on the outside. And if not, I'll do the backside of those islands where it's nice and safe. And we're going to get that data. Uh, and it's terrible data. It's horrible to go out there and not see nothing. Well, you're you're right. going to you're going to have obviously enough for a major documentary when you get back with all this. And yeah, you're, so you really should put it together. I'm sure there are many. I people will. Out there. I am. I am thinking about it now for some reason. I'm starting to consider it. Uh, I'm not. I'm more right now. I'm interested in only in getting to that, and when it's all said and done in a few months, mm-hmm. and I won't have to do this no more. Yeah, then, I, then I'll slowly upload it. It'll take a couple of months to put it all up at the nuclearproctologist.org. And at the same time, I'll put together that document documentary. And I'm not sure if I'll take it any further than that. But uh, it will be a proper, a well-thought-out, uh, methodically. Well, I will uh, take it as, I'll take it as far yeah. as you want. So, And, of course, people like yourself, uh, without, you know, like, the audience that you're able to bring to it and, and, and the power and the authority that you can bring to it, it probably wouldn't go nowhere anyway. And so we'll, we're completely uh, dependent upon people to help. You just you can. just put it together, my friend, and I'll uh, I'll make sure it gets seen, and we can do that for sure. Okay. It's, uh, well, you showed me that the last time, didn't you? <laughs> you really uh, helped in an amazing way, and that's why we're here now. Happy to do it. Uh, let me check and see if we've got Yochi yet. Are you there, Yochi? Yoichi Shimatsu is in Thailand, and we're having a hell of a time getting him, and I, I'm afraid they're blocking him again. They're, they're becoming more aggressive in a very quiet, stealthy way in trying to shut the information down. Uh, the next thing we're going to run into is this Kelp Watch 2014. They, they're taking their last samples, I guess, now, and we already... We're witness to the Dr. Kai Vetter, the director of the program, the only guy who's going to actually make the determination of what was found in the kelp wow. samples. Three different times during the last year, they have gathered samples from 19 locations off the coast of California. They may have changed that a little bit, but they're going to announce how much radioactivity there is in the kelp. The kelp is like a sponge. It really picks it up. It's got a, uh, yeah. the bull kelp, I guess, especially. Well, a lot of it has kind of a, a filmy, sticky, uh, s- substance on the outside and things stick to it. And we, all you got to do is wash that off and you can change the results of the, of the test. So we'll, <laughs> we know what's coming. We know what's coming. You just, just swap it out with some other kelp. There's not. He's so easy and to who's do. The, who's, who's ever going to know? Who's going to know? Because cause one How guy... Could possibly know? Yeah. Yeah, one guy is going to come up with the results. And he had to backtrack after he made the statement that... I, I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, we know right now we're not going to find anything that you should worry about. You know, he had, he had to... <laughs> this is a scientist? Uh, within a week, he had to withdraw that comment and say, well, of course we really don't know yeah, what we're going to I did. Mm-hmm. You put headlines up there, and you, you really stuck it. To, even just yeah. with the headline, every, everybody had no problem digesting that and understanding yeah. exactly yeah. what he well, was up to. It, it's that disgusting. was brilliant, by the way. I mean, science is supposed to be our champion, our savior, and, yeah. and what guides us through the darkness as we learn Great. more and more about our life on this planet. Um, here's, a, just for you, we have a minute till the break. Here's a little bit of a sample of uh, what the orcas sound like just for a minute or so, so you can get an idea of what is no longer being heard. Well, you get an idea, I think. A little more. Quiet. 
quite a quite a vocabulary. This is a documentary called Voice of the Orchid. You can find it online. Beautiful, beautiful nature up there. Mm. This is where Dana is right now. And tragically, it is said that they will be gone, at least in this part of the world, within the next two, three years. 21, 58, 43. They are really something. It's the whole pot of them going by in the the film now. Okay, uh, it is uh, New Year's Eve, the year 2014, and we are, of course, out west uh, in the east, in New York, on the east coast. It is now 2015. I let them listen to uh, the sound of the orcas. Uh, they're up, uh, they made a documentary somewhere up there in the area you are, and what a vocabulary. Wow. Yeah, isn't it? That- yes. It's just, it's just, it's a haunting sound. Yeah, it's, uh, it is haunting. And they, the way they swim in pods. Now, no more babies. No more baby orcas. All right, we'll be right back. Uh, hold on, Dana, please. We'll uh, take a break and come right back. Dana Durnford, who is up there heroically doing the work that the government, all of the government knows, but they're never, not going to tell us. So thanks to Dana, we're going to find out more than he has already shown us, which is horrific. Back in a minute. Okay, and we're back. Hard to believe, New Year's Eve. Uh, Here is that sound, Dana, that you don't hear anymore. I'll play it just a little bit because Dana missed it. Uh, But this this is the sound. As I said earlier, that's they have quite a vocabulary, obviously. And Heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very sad. No. Your point Excuse about... Me, just flooded me. Yeah. It's well. shocking to hear. Uh, and you're not going to hear that no more, folks. That's horrible. It's just, it's just horrible. And nobody, like Jeff always says, nobody wants to mention the R word. And no. at some point, in a very, very close future, not... In two years' time, but in 2015, this is going to break. Well, uh, this, 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 this will have to be Dane of the Year that, uh, that we break it loose. March is coming up, and I'm going to push very hard on this. The, the mainstream media is, is not journalism anymore, as you well know, and our listeners know. It's just corporate propaganda outlets. That's all it is. And the corporation, in fact, is the government. Uh, it's, we are a corporatocracy. Corporations own nuclear power. Uh, it's not to be talked about. So it's out of the headlines. It's gone. Another recent example of, of how easy it is to turn the tap off on information was when the Associated Press, Dana, announced that uh, it would no longer be covering Ebola in the U.S. in terms of suspected cases, people being put in quarantine or isolation or watched uh, they just said no more. We don't want to be involved with this. There's too much panic potential. So there's no more. You know, when's the last time, folks, you saw much of anything, aside from Rents.com, about Ebola? You don't see it. But take my word for it, we have Ebola cases right now in this country. Dr. Patty Doyle has been tracking the two, at least two, air ambulances. They're BSL-4 air ambulances that have been flying back and forth between the U.S. and Africa, Western Africa, bringing people in here. They're experimenting on them, obviously. Uh, we don't know what they're doing, but that's why they're bringing them over here. And no, they're not all volunteer health care workers, or we'd be hearing about that. This is all being done on the QT, very, very quiet, very stealthy. So the, the media cannot be depended upon. And I, I ran a story yesterday about how many young people now are no longer paying any attention to the mainstream media, 
I think that's great. I hope they do tune in to the alternative media. That was a sense of things. Uh, but the, the alternative media, I'm sorry to say, has its problems too. So <laughs> it's all about money. It's all about control. And if there is something that needs to be penetrated and co-opted, uh, the government will find a way to do it. And that's just, a, that's just the truth. That's why what Dana is doing is so critically important. Um, how much of it is on your website now? If people go there? Um, well, the lower Canada British Columbia is up there. I don't have the bandwidth to get this stuff up that I'm getting right at this moment. Uh huh. And trying to resolve that, but I was trying to buy, um, you can buy minutes, uh, like a dongle you slip into your laptop into your USB port and it connects to, uh, the 4G network, I guess. And you can, it's expensive, it's like $25 for half a gigabyte, and I'll shoot four or five gigabytes a day, and so that would be extremely, because it, it, I'm running on a tiny budget all the time, Yeah, it's very expensive, that's why I stay out for three days, or even four and five days coming up is what the plan is, because it's just prohibitively expensive to run back and forth to port all the time, mm-hmm. and so it's better to move along the coastline, but it's very tricky to do that. You, you know, it's dark at 4.30 in the afternoon or something, and it doesn't get daylight till 9 o'clock in the morning. And so you're stuck in the dark in the middle of nowhere, and you got to tough it out no matter what. And so the daytime, you're so busy, and you're always, your eyeballs don't stop. You're trying to get the pictures at the same time. you got to keep your eye on the sounder, and you got to keep your eye on in front of you and around you because not all rocks are going to be in the Well, I see. now you're all alone, too, and this is That's you're not. doing the work of three or four people. Uh, it's just it's, nuts. Absolutely. It is. It's madness. Uh, and then, But once the trip is over and the trip is over, we'll have all that data. Uh, but what the idea right now is, and I already got it done, is I got lower quality uh, screen captures of the high quality ones, and I'll put up a couple of hundred of each area for each day. Uh huh. And as soon as you get a little bit of a bandwidth, that won't be too hard to get up, and that'll give some context of that particular day. And another thing I'm going to do is make videos each day and break down what took place that day, just short synopsis of that day, and post that up there too. And so that'll take a lot of weight off. Mm hmm. You know, trying to get the pictures uh, where people are waiting, at least they got some idea what took place and some documentations of that and right. the actual pictures of it. Uh, but I mean, all pictures are looking the same. All islands are looking the same. They are. And I'm going out into the west coast of uh, Canada here on the outside mm-hmm. of the islands because the weather broke. And my goodness, right out to the very last islands. And if you're not going to find it there, then it's not going to be anywhere else. But still got to document it, unfortunately, because that's all I can do at this stage. And just keep documenting and show that that's true, true, symmetrically throughout this entire coastline. Mm-hmm. And i just go back and make a point about the Ebola. Uh, the nuclear industry folks, and not aware, uh, used to dig up people that died who lived close to what they called the Darren Winders, who lived close to nuclear plants, or that they actually experimented on secretively in hospitals and mm-hmm. and other places, and they would dig up these people to find out what the radiation then got into them and how it killed them and stuff like that. Exactly. And so the Ebola that they're sneaking in here, because like you said probably, I don't know if that's true, but I feel that they created it, and that's probably what they're up to, is they need to bring back uh, their handiwork and study it. Oh, I and, agree. But they don't want to publicize that. No. And people no. like yourself would figure it out right away if it was public. You'd be able to come out and slam and say and find the connections. Yeah. And so if they started naming them, everybody would know where they're coming from, and they're all coming from the same area. It wouldn't take long for someone like yourselves who really know what's going on. They're linked up, certain companies or something like well, that, and that that would be right. devastating. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I was just uh, looking at the site. Uh, it's the the nuclear proctologist dot o r g, and you can see you've got. Uh, we're going to take a break here, but we've got uh, your sections header. If you click on that, you'll see the radiation 
map, so to speak, of the North Pacific. And there's a lot of material. There's an unbelievable amount of material, in fact, on the nuclearproctologist.org. Hold on a sec. We'll come right back with Dana and hope we can connect with uh, Yochi. He wanted to say Happy New Year to everyone, so we'll see. Be right back. Okay, welcome back. Uh, Jeff here. You're there. Dana is up uh, off the coast of BC. Are you? Uh, yeah. Are you on the boat now? Or are you yep. in? Yep. On the boat. Wow. On the boat, tied up in the dock, waiting for a prop to show up, and then I'm gone again. Okay. Now we're running you... good. Everything's a turnkey. That's sense, right? So I'm good. Good. All no right. Prop. When you go out uh, each day and you pull in, you get near a place, are you taking digital video? Are you taking stills? What are you doing? Great. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to get up to a thousand pictures a day. Jeez. And I also take the videos and yeah, because I'm going from island to island to island to island, I circle those little islands if possible, if it's safe to do it. Mm-hmm. And I wanna get every inch of that shoreline that I can. And I decided that that's you know, that's the better thing to do is get it, everything I can possibly get and then mm-hmm. deal with it after. And that way I feel better because I don't, there's nowhere on that island I didn't try to cover. That I understand. I can cover. Yeah. There, there must be a tremendous impact on these islands already in terms of the biology and what's going on there. Uh, we talked about insects and other things and, Certainly things that wash up on shore, uh, feeding birds. Usually you'll see, I guess, seagulls by the thousands, correct, up there? Right. You would see seagulls, and there's a 148 localized species of birds up here, and then there's oh. 169 species of migratory birds, mm-hmm. and they depend upon the mud flats at the low tide zones uh, for their migratory routes, and that's where they'll feed on small fries. And invertebrates, and there's 6,500 invertebrates on the coastline, and I never found none of those, of course. And anybody's not familiar, uh, there's 480 species of worms, I found none of those, and there's 70 species of sponges, and I found five or six species altogether throughout the entire coastline, folks, and 78 species of sea anemones. Um, and you know how I've talked, Jeff, yourself, you remember how I talked many times about the white sea anemones and how they sure. cover all the rocks. I, I talked to a senior elder in a native, isolated a native community a few days back, mm-hmm. 70 odd years old, and he asked me what I was doing. And, you know, it's sad when I, when I meet these people because I, they're 100% living on the land out there. And I asked him about, because it was almost low tide right across from us, and it was only say, 100 feet away. And I said, Do you remember when every one of those rocks were covered with white sea anemones? And he, he pulled back his head, and, and like he looked at me, and he said, yes, of course. And I said, well, where are they? He said, I don't know. He said, but I've noticed that, that they're gone. And so I said, you remember when it was really dangerous to try to get up from low tide? He said, yes. And he said, my grandmother would, would always fret because we would go down in, at low tide, and that, that's where you would really get hurt because it was extremely dangerous. So it was a really fascinating conversation I had with him, a very sad con- conversation, of course, as he started to tell me that stuff. And that was a very sad night. I stayed at that wharf that night, and I left at daybreak. And there were people, uh, natives were coming and going with their guns, and they were going out just before dark there and pulling their traps, and, and, and uh, the quads were coming down on the wharf with the little trailers and picking up the traps with the crabs in it. Mm-hmm. And not a lot, but with crabs in it, and then driving up to the houses and throwing it on in front of the house. And I mean, the community was operating, and no, no idea whatsoever of, of what they're eating, of what, of what they're eating, and what's really going on around them, and how short of time they have left to live that environment. And you know, they have a beautiful spot there, beautiful boats, mm-hmm. and they all depend upon that land. It was really. It really haunts me again, just like the killer whales does, that when I think about it here, sitting here, that he understood that, what I told him. 
And he said to me, he said, and I could, you know, I was trying to do it. I was trying to meet up with the chief when I was there, and I'll go back and find the chief at some point mm-hmm. before I moved down the coastline and mm-hmm. sure and getting copies of everything I got of that whole coastline and break it down for them because they need to know. And the same with all those native communities along the way. There's not a lot of communities up there, mostly natives, and uh, they have no con- no no concept, and nobody's going to tell them. And no, they, the nu- they, the nuclear industry will not tell anybody anything. And I asked him about cancer in the community, and he said it's terrible. Oh, really? The worst couple of years, he said this has got to be the worst couple of years of cancer he's ever seen. It's just tragedy. Oh, and there was a young fellow come down, and mm-hmm. I was going to give him a ride out there mm-hmm. because he missed his boat, and his mother, there was a whole bunch of them come down, and they brought his mom down. She was dead, and she, he said at least the suffering was over. Uh, she was full of cancer, but then Kikatla has a crew boat, and that showed up and took him. But I was going to run him out there because as soon as he said the cancer, that that always gets to me, and especially in those communities, and they don't understand what's going on. And the, the 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 elder native was telling me he he doesn't remember cancer as a child out there. No no memory of that. I believe people it. like that. Yeah. Well, when I was a kid, you didn't hear much about cancer. You didn't have uh, fat kids in school. Uh, yeah. Kids were skinny and they'd run around, and now they they waddle like ducks. You do. It's, sure. uh, this is uh, something I hope you can continue to do to talk to the locals up there and just ask them questions yeah. uh, without without front loading them and to see what they say. Oh, it's got to be heartbreaking. A way of life but is when, coming to an end. Yeah, they come up and approach me. It's not a little easier for me if they ask me what I'm doing, yeah. and then I have to tell them, right? And I of don't course. mind that part, that I can deal with it. I still have trepidations about it, but yeah. uh, that's what I want to do. I want to engage these people, and I'm trying, but um, I lost uh, my wheelchair washed over the deck, and I lost a couple of jury cans, and so it's a little harder for me to get around. You lost your wheelchair? Yeah, oh, I got geez. washed over. I, don't, I didn't even know it was gone. And uh, not much you can do about it once it's down over the side. But it was pretty rough. There was probably nothing. I, I couldn't have went back and got it even if I had it known as it was too. It would have been too rough. To well, you sent me the video and you posted it of uh, that one day, and I, it was rough. Yeah. Uh, somebody else was uh, piloting the boat. Uh, you were in, back there taking video of it, but no thanks. Uh, I don't know how you're doing this, but uh, I'm. Do it because got to get done. It had um, to get done, well, uh, and I, I'm lucky enough to have the skills and uh, enough courage to get through each day. It, well, it's you a struggle. S- you certainly are doing something that few men or women would ever even dream of trying to do. When you're when you're out now, uh, the weather is broken. You're able to do your work pretty much. That storm that w- was weird. That lasted for a long time, weeks. Yeah, uh, four weeks straight. Four four weeks. All right. Every yeah. every day, relentlessly. Everybody well, was pinned down. Yeah. Yeah. And I haven't seen that. Like, there's these five days of bad weather and four days of good and four right. days of bad weather and five days of good. And so that's just the pattern. That's why I was so confident in the things I was going to do. And so once, you know, you get the, the weather two days to calm down after the weather breaks and then the seas will be flat. And so then you would just, only 50 miles across to the Charlotte's and that would take me two hours, maybe. Got it. An hour yeah. and a half or something. But I would wait the two days, and instead I waited four weeks, and I just said, no, nah, I'm not going to go over there, because after four weeks, I wouldn't want to get over there and get stuck for four weeks. I'm not gonna, I don't carry enough food and water no, no. And supplies for that. You know, Dana, if you can, uh, I don't know if you're going to go back and talk to this elder again. I am, actually, yes. But I would try and, and ask him if uh, you can set your camera up on a tripod or whatever and just take some... Take some I am. Uh, I was trying to find him after, actually, and I wanted to invite him over for a cup of tea and actually do that. Mm-hmm. And he was down to bed, so I left him alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did move my boat over closer just in case he showed up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, 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 like he told me he wanted me to do a presentation in the community, and everybody should hear what I had to say. They should, and maybe you can yeah. get someone that's, else to actually. That's what I was hold. trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, to hold the camera and. and uh, Use it while you interview him. What, whatever, whatever makes him comfortable. I got the He's, tripod, and yeah, no, he, yeah. he was a nice person. They yeah. all, they all share. 
and they don't see many people like me show up in their community. No, anyway. they never will again. <laughs> and I'm very respectful. I understand, um, you know, I'm in their community, and so I don't, I can't do much anyway. I'm stuck on the boat. I really can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. That, you know, and now that I ain't got the wheelchair, and that's okay, too, because that forces me to do things that I normally would never have done, and I feel better about trying harder to do, you know, to get around a bit after 15 years. Wow. And folks are not familiar, I had a, a diving ministry. I was a commercial diver, and I used to spend six hours a day on the ocean floor, 315 days a year. And so I really know the ocean extremely well. And on this boat ocean in Canada, year after year, and I ran some of the biggest operations, period, better than nothing, actually, mm-hmm. uh, year after year. And I ran most of the fleets up here and on the East Coast. And so I have a unique perspective. I also done every industry on both oceans, above the ocean and underwater. So I come from a unique perspective. And I studied the nuclear industry for many years. And so I understand that extremely well. And like Jeff was saying, there's a lot up there at the nuclear proctologist in chronological order to help people get a grip on it. And it's a wonderful site. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun it's, site. It's an essential site. It's possible, site. I guess. But yeah. Each picture is, is the reformatted seven different ways. So it's a good experience no matter what the device people are using. So a lot of work into it. And the idea is just to help people come to terms and understand there's another narrative. Exactly. And you know it was narrative, so well. Go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just going to say we're, we're out of time. and, and uh, We'll talk to you next Monday, hopefully, if you're available. And, I'll uh, try. You can try. If I'm in port, I'll have a single. Okay. All it's right. not a really good single when I'm too, but it's pretty good. Well, on behalf of all those who care, and even those who don't, who are too dumb to care, uh, thank you, Dana, for all you've done this year and in the years past and, and in the years to come. We'll, we'll work on this together and keep Thank pounding you. away at it. Absolutely, 100%. All Good right. night, my friends. Good Take night. Care. Happy Take New care. Year. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. The very brave man. So is Yochi Shimatsu, who we unfortunately couldn't get on tonight. Something's, uh, something's wrong with his phones. They're playing games again, but he'll be on next Monday. All right, I guess the best way to sum it up is fasten your seatbelts. God bless all of you, and hold on tight. It's going to be a bumpy ride next year. And indeed, uh, for what it's worth, Happy New Year.